From the Pittsburgh Ledger, PL Media, and The Drop, this is a podcast exploring the accountability murders in Pittsburgh. I'm Julia Page, and we're asking, who is no one? Why did you do this? Oh, why help me? What do you want? To account for what I've opened up in Pittsburgh. Hi. Once again, I'm Julia Page, a reporter for the Pittsburgh Ledger. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm joined, as always, by the Ledger's Metro editor, Teddy Barstow. Howdy, folks. So before we get into our recap of no one related activity, I wanted to take a second to express some frustration, I guess. Oh, that sounds awfully close to editorializing, Julia. No, no, it's not actually about me. Not really. When it comes to an investigation like this, an active situation, there's always a balance to be struck between trying to understand the pieces we have already and chasing the events that are unfolding around us in real time. As I alluded to before, this is frustrating for a journalist because understanding feels productive and meaningful, but chasing can feel shallow and pointless. That's part of keeping people informed, though. You you can't understand what you don't know about. Sure, of course. But the reason I bring it up at all is I'm worried that the ripple effects we've talked about in our previous episodes are actually inherent to this so-called accountability idea, which is at the heart of all of this. My concern is that the reason you and I, Teddy, are always chasing is because that's, well, a natural outcome of everyone seeking their own perceived justice from everyone else. We're all the heroes of our own stories, right? But my fear is that's endless and will ripple outward forever, and we'll be so busy chasing the consequences and the ripples that we'll never really get to examine the source. So this frustration is entirely ideological? It's a little bit personal. We're certainly going to talk about what happened at Pete's Pub earlier this week. But I just wanted to voice my concern first, because listeners might be drowning in the flood of new developments, and I... You know what? Let's just do the recap. Why don't I handle it this episode? Please. Okay, first, an update on a central character to our story. Former Pittsburgh Police Assistant Chief of Operations Ben Kern, who I sat down with last episode. It's been a month since Ben turned in his papers and retired, but given his connection to Richard Rowe accountability killer Aaron Kern, a quiet life out of the public eye doesn't seem to be in the cards right now. One month after stepping down, former Assistant Chief of Operations Ben Kern has still not made a public statement regarding his son, accused killer Aaron Kern, nor has he answered questions regarding what his role may have been in covering up Richard Rowe's true identity. Actually, he did right here on our podcast last month. But we have received no word from Ben Kern on whether his retirement is related to preparations for his son Aaron's upcoming trial. All we do know is that Aaron has yet to hire counsel. Sources say his public defender is discussing a possible plea which could hinge on an agreement to include cooperation against any potential co-conspirators. With Michael Kern's killer still on the loose, we can't help but wonder about the timing of Ben's retirement. Was there a conflict of interest that motivated him stepping down? The title of our podcast is, of course, Who is No One? And we have some fresh media speculation on that front. Leaks from inside the Pittsburgh Police Department that suggest a working theory that no one is, in fact, the third copycat killer is gaining traction. I do want to say here, I'm not sure where the Tribune is sourcing this, but it doesn't line up with what I've heard. Unless no one's true objective is chaos, it's a contradiction of stated ideology. In fact, he vowed to stop Roe, not continue his work. Add to which Ben Kern claims no one saved him from the copycat. Exactly. Speaking of the copycat, police sources say there haven't been any other copycat acts of violence since last episode. But there was a no one sighting, a particularly significant one, which we'll get to shortly. And finally, let's take a look at a seemingly unrelated crime that will tie right into the central thread of today's episode. A quick warning. Some listeners may find the following audio disturbing. This is from the dash cam video of rideshare driver Chris O'Neill, released by his family earlier this week. Dude, slow the fuck down, man. Slow down. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What the hell? What the hell? Chris Driver 98. <laughs> I fucking found you. Do I, do 
I know you? It's K-Boss, bitch. So let's finish our conversation, huh? Where do we leave off? Hmm? You said you were gonna... That was what? Me? I was just talking shit, man. You thought you were gonna know one me, bitch? I, I was just joking. You gonna Richard roll my ass? I'm sorry, okay? Bad fucking luck, man. I'm not like those other pussies. Yeah. Okay, whoa, Candace whoa, don't Chubosky fucking kill me. Don't fucking back. kill me. He I, goes don't, to don't, your I'm, house, I'm not, I'm not, he puts a gun to your mother's head, me, and don't he pulls the fucking, kill me, fucking don't trigger. Don't fucking kill me. Police confirming that 29-year-old Kenneth Chabosky has been arrested in the shooting of 27-year-old Chris O'Neill, whom Chabosky believed was going to swat him. Swatting is a form of harassment where attackers call 911 under the false pretense of a hostage or active shooter situation done to trick police forces into sending heavily armed SWAT teams to the victim's home or business. Insidious stuff. In the case of Chabosky and O'Neill, they were two Reddit users who had gotten into a disagreement on the pro-gun subreddit 2A All Day. People online not getting along? Shocking. Their argument escalated to threats because that's how these things go. And then O'Neill made the fatal mistake of threatening to swat Chabosky at his home. In turn, Chabosky promised to hunt him down and shoot him first, going so far as to call it, quote, justified self-defense all over your bitch ass. O'Neill replied with a Try me, loser, and that was the end of it. It being their online exchange. Their next interaction was the night of May 1st on Craft Avenue, beside a gas station less than a mile from O'Neill's home. A staged accident turned premeditated murder. Except Kenneth Chabosky claimed self-defense. This f***ing guy said he was going to swap me at my house. Do you understand me? Where I live with my mom and my sisters and my f***ing grandmother, who's 70 years old. Do you know what happens when a heavily armed police force knocks down your door thinking there's an active shooter inside? And I'm a gun advocate. I have a house full of guns. They would have f wasted my whole family. Chabosky's heartfelt justification did not fall on deaf ears with the grand jury. Satisfied with Mr. Chabosky's account of self-defense, the grand jury elected not to recommend charges against him. Uh, Is fear of being targeted a valid justification for violence? This move from the Pittsburgh District Attorney may, through precedent, lay the initial groundwork for that, through what some are now calling... The Chabosky defense. Preemptive. Proactive. Premeditated. Whatever you call it, we are seeing the ripple effects of the accountability murders and the rise of no one. You heard it in the audio. Chabosky actually cited no one and Roe. No one wanted to change things, but I can't imagine this was what he meant. So we were teed up to do an episode on the case against Aaron Kern, but reluctantly, we're going to pivot and stay with Chabosky instead. Obviously, there's a link from Chabosky to no one through his alleged fear of being targeted online, but there's actually a much more direct physical connection between the two. And between Chabosky and the podcast. Mm. What you're about to hear was recorded straight from my phone two days ago. Hello? Is anyone there? Oh, oh shit. I didn't think I... You're Julia Page, right? Who is this? My name's Kenneth. Kenneth Chabosky. Uh, Kenny's fine. Listen, I gotta talk to you about what happened, because I'm on the vanguard here against this no one shit. Listen, this is a private number. Okay, the podcast has a hey, website. Hey, people are saying a lot of bad shit about me. I gotta set the record... At that point, I wasn't fully up on the Chabosky situation yet. The viral dash cam video hadn't come out. I just thought this was an agitated fan of the podcast who tracked down my personal cell. So I hung up and blocked the number. Unfortunately, though, that wasn't my last encounter with Kenneth Chabosky. Now, listeners may have seen coverage of this already. It's been, let's be honest, everywhere. They may have also read the article by Alejandro Rios that went up on the ledger earlier this week. But again, in the interest of providing context, we're going to talk about what happened at Pete's Pub right now, with as much depth as we can. And we have audio. We do. Earlier this week, Kenneth Chabosky confronted, threatened, and then attacked me. First things first, I'm okay. A little scraped up, but fine. It was very fast, the confrontation, and violent. But we'll get to that. I was at the bar, which is across town from the ledger, meeting with a source about, well, I can't tell you that, actually. For the episode we didn't end up doing. Right. 
I had turned on my recorder while we talked, probably a half an hour or so, and then we wrapped up and he left. Which is when Kenneth Chabosky walked up to me. Do you think he was waiting until you were alone? I don't know. Possibly. Yes. At this point, I did recognize him from the Chris O'Neill incident. I wasn't feeling safe. I turned my recorder back on, just in case, well, you know. Something happened. Yeah. <clears throat> Here it is. What do you want, Kenneth? Well, for starters, how about some frickin' respect? For what? For being out here, in front, for standing up against this shit when no one else will? I'm an advocate, Julia, a goddamn warrior for our constitutional rights. <laughs> you, you have no idea what I've been through, what it's like to have your life threatened. I, I know how important it is to fight back against the kind of people who do this. People need to hear that from someone like me. You're being heard plenty, Kenneth. You know who isn't? Chris O'Neill. Yeah, because he was threatening my life. Why did none of you people care about that? What is this, Kenneth? Are you stalking me? No, no. How did you know I was going to be here? I just think you can help me use my platform for good. But you hang up on me. You block me from telling my truth. I don't even know who you are. Well, you know who I am now. So stop being a bitch about it, okay? Let's do this fucking interview. Okay, buddy, you're done. Get out. Fuck you! Fuck both of you! Hey, get the fuck out right now, or I'm calling the fucking... Terry, get him the fuck out! This ain't over, bitch! Guy is unhinged. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm fine. It's okay. Do you want to play the next part? We don't have to. I know. And look, I appreciate that, I do, but... Everyone in this city has been affected by what's happening. Or if they haven't been, they might soon be. I also believe that as you're about to hear, what happened to me gives us some additional context on more than one front. First is context on who Kenneth Chabosky really is. Remember, this is a man whose name has been used to brand a controversial self-defense strategy, which could lead to precedent and even new legislation. Second is my interaction with no one himself. And the decision to share this all today, this was certainly a discussion we all had behind the scenes. Ultimately, though, I felt like this was something listeners needed to hear for context. Okay, let's roll it then. Where does this pick up from? From me approaching my car after leaving the bar. <clears throat> Again, I turned my recorder on, just in case. Shit! Kenneth! Kenneth, think very carefully about your next move here. Oh, I am thinking. I'm thinking you're a gatekeeping piece of shit. Put that down. This isn't going to get you what you want. Oh, let's find out, huh? Don't! <laughs> Just calm the fuck down, come with me, do the fucking interview, and you just might- uh. Uh. Oh, fuck, fuck, no, 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 give, give that back. You like to play with guns. You like to make people feel afraid. Uh. Oh, my fucking ears, you fucking- Are you hurt? You're no one. Hello, Julia. Y you know who I am? Why did you do this? He was going to hurt you. No, but, but why help me? What do you want? To account for what I've opened up in Pittsburgh. The police arrived almost immediately after, responding to the gunshot, which had been called in. For the sake of clarity, I need to make clear that no one did not shoot Chabosky. He beat him pretty good, but that gunshot you heard was to the side, possibly an intimidation tactic. It also left Chabosky dazed. Teddy and I both know that eyewitness accounts are unreliable, subjective, and that's true in regular situations too, but here, this was a person in no one who I've been thinking about nonstop for weeks. This, at times, almost mythic-level figure in Pittsburgh, self-designed to be iconic, presumably dangerous, was standing right in front of me. But I had just been thrown to the ground, and things were definitely hazy. Having said that, what was he like uh, up close? What stood out? And that's the problem. I, 
unfortunately don't know that I could tell you anything objective. Height, weight. His suit looked like there was some kind of armored plating. The design of his helmet, I remember it being strange to look at. I remember thinking the circle on his helmet looked like it could be a camera. Subjectively, though, I, I felt he was scanning. Very aware of his surroundings. Precise. Deliberate. What no one said at the end. That's the exact thing you said at the end of episode one. To account for what I've opened up in Pittsburgh. Yes. So he may also listen to the podcast. He may. And that's the wrinkle here, isn't it? He saved my life. But his actions might have been what led me to being in danger in the first place. We're investigating him, but he's listening to us. It's not just ripples. It's ripples bouncing off, ripples violently slamming into each other. I think that's a pretty good place to leave things. There's just the Kemp statement that we missed at the top. We can save it until the next time, though. Now let's do it. One more ripple, right? Okay. Um, our last bit is about athlete-turned-progressive activist Donovan Kemp. Donovan is the brother of State Senator Noah Kemp. If you check your scorecards, Senator Kemp was Richard Rowe's third victim. He survived the attack in large part thanks to the intervention of no one. We played that encounter in episode one. Senator Kemp has since taken an aggressive stance on self-defense rights, and now Donovan is using his platform to attack his brother. Here's the comment from a recent interview on Pittsburgh Radio. Look, whatever the truth of the situation that no one was investigating, whether it was able to be tied officially to my brother or not, make no mistake. They were right about Noah. He is corrupt. Senator Kemp was the lone target of no one's doxing, whose evidence was never directly tied to him. So it's certainly a notable statement coming from a family member who, until recently, had been a staunch supporter. My brother is self-interested. Exactly the kind of abuser of democracy that no one is trying to shine a light on. The kind of me-first politician that progressive action now is up against as we try to build a future that is fair and equitable to all. Sounds like there's been a split. Clearly, no one's impact on the political sphere continues to grow. Anyway, I know we usually try to end on a more definitive point, but, well, I guess Ripples is it. Ripples. Thank you all for listening. For the Pittsburgh Ledger and The Drop, this is Who Is No One. I'm Julia Page, and he's Teddy Barstow. If you haven't already, please remember to subscribe to the show on your podcast app of choice. Just like no one has, apparently. You're shameless. Thanks, everyone. To read more about No One, head to blackmarket.la. Who is No One is produced in partnership with Black Market Narrative and ZQ Entertainment. Black Market Narrative.